Welcome back to Virology Live. This is session number 10, Assembly of Viruses. Today we're going to build some virus particles. If you look at any particular virus, you can know how it's formed. The structure of a virus particle determines how it's formed. So if you look at an icosahedral particle here in the upper left, you should immediately know after today's session, of course, how it's formed. And if you look at um, an envelope virus particle with glycoproteins in the viral membrane, you should know how it is formed. So that's the good thing about virology in, in the sense that the way we're teaching it, that I tell you there are seven genome types, there are three structural types, and um, now, you know, you can look at the Baltimore scheme and know how a genome gets to mRNA, and today you're going to know, looking at a virus particle, how it assembles. All virus particles complete a common set of assembly reactions, which are outlined here. There are a few differences that can go one way or another. Common set, though, for example, First, formation of individual structural units of the protein shell from one or several viral proteins. The protein shell has to assemble by interactions among the subunits, and we talked about these kinds of interactions based on symmetry before. Very important step here, packaging of the nucleic acid, and the word here is selective. If... Um, it's not selective. <laughs> You're going to package cellular nucleic acids, and we don't want to do that because they wouldn't make an infectious virus. So selective packaging, we're going to talk about how that works today. Now, for some viruses, that completes the assembly reaction, and they're released from a host cell. But, you know, those are typically the icosahedral particle. Uh, for others, they need to acquire an envelope or a membrane. These are enveloped viruses, and then they are released from the host cell. Uh, and then, of course, those virus particles can go on and infect a new cell. However, we have a little diversion on this uh, schematic here, right? Maturation of virus particles? Wait a minute. You're released from the host cell and then maturing? Yes, in fact, as we will see today for some viruses, in particular retroviruses, they mature after being released from the host cell. Very interesting situation there. Now, of course, just like every other part of the virus reproduction cycle, assembly of virus particles depends on the host cell machinery in many ways. That's why they're viruses. If they weren't dependent on all these things, they wouldn't be viruses. So this idea that Vi some viruses are independent is just absurd. They're not. And some of the cell machinery uh, that is required for assembly, by, not, by no means all, cellular chaperones. Yeah, the sh chaperone is the word. You know what it means. You need a chaperone to do this or that, to, to watch out for you so that you don't get in trouble. There are cellular chaperones, typically proteins, and they um, make sure that the folding reactions occur properly. If It's very interesting that uh, cellular chaperones are making sure that virus proteins are folded correctly, right? Um, there are certainly virus-encoded chaperones as well, but there are many host chaperones, and it's just like hepatitis B virus or parvovirus DNA entering the nucleus. It's repaired by host cell enzymes. The cell doesn't distinguish between those nucleic acids and self. And, and in this case, they don't distinguish between viral proteins. They make them fold properly, and that's why it works in part. Transport systems to get proteins. We talked about transport systems getting viral genomes into the cell. But now we're going to talk about transport system getting out of the cell. The secretory pathway, of course, this is the pathway by which membrane proteins are 
put on the surface of the cell, the plasma membrane. And so this, this is used, and we'll see how that works today. And, of course, nuclear import and export machinery. There are pores in the nuclear membrane. There's a membrane around the nucleus, which is impermeable. Uh, it has pores so that molecules up to a certain size can get in and out. And that requires a selective transport system, import and export. And viral uh, proteins take advantage of that. Nucleic acids go in and out as well, but they always have to be bound to a protein because the import-export machinery of the nucleus is protein-based. And remember, cell cytoplasm and nucleus is very crowded. So things have to move in heavy traffic. What, is, what does that mean? Well, there's, there's short-distance movement, angstroms to nanometers, uh, for example, across membranes. Various membranes, plasma membrane, nuclear membrane, ER, Golgi, and these can involve pores for smaller components through which um, material moves on an energy-based system. And then, of course, there's long-distance movement on m motor proteins moving along the tracks of cytoskeletal elements. And so we talked about that, how many viral components and even the vesicles containing them can move along microtubules. This is much longer distance to get from plasma membrane down to the nucleus and so forth. And these will work in the opposite direction. And here on the right is an experiment designed to illustrate this principle. So we have on the top a uh, cell that is uh, infected with vesicular stomatitis virus. This is a figure from Principles of Virology. And it's stained uh, with, in three different ways. First, it's stained with DAPI, which shows, which stains DNA, of course, and it's blue. That's the nucleus in the middle. And then tubulin is stained. That's red. This is an antibody to tubulin protein, which makes up microtubules. And you can see the uh, long nature of those microtubules, and that's how things get towards the nucleus and away from the nucleus on motor proteins. And then finally, we have an antibody to the viral N protein, which you remember coats the uh, RNA genome of the virus. And so in the infected cell on the top, you can see that these um, nuclear proteins, which are most likely complexed with viral RNA, are moving throughout the cytoplasm on these uh, microtubules. Now, in the bottom panel, we have treated the cells, the infected cells, with a drug called nocotazole. Nocotazole depolymerizes the microtubules. So you can see right away the red staining. There are no more nice filamentous tracks. It, uh, the tubulin has been dispersed throughout the cytosol, so no, things can no longer move on it as a result of treatment with this drug. And now you can see the viral nuclear uh, end protein is, is stuck in foci throughout the cytoplasm. They are not going anywhere. So this is a great illustration of the need for these microtubules for uh, viruses to move around the cell. Another important concept that we need to remember from today um, uh, is that nothing happens fast in dilute solutions. And you know, the cytoplasm is by no means dilute, but actually for virus purposes, it is. They need to concentrate even more, and that's why we have areas where reproduction occurs, which we call factories or inclusions, and we've mentioned these before, when we talked about um, RNA synthesis occurring on membranous vesicles. And the idea here is that you carry out reactions in a concentrated environment. So there's no need to find the components. So, for example, poliovirus induces the synthesis of double membraned vesicles uh, in the infected cell. And it's on the surface of those vesicles that RNA synthesis occurs. The RNA replication complex is attached to those membranes. And presumably, that makes sure that everything is in one place, that the RNA, the polymerase and accessory proteins and so forth are all there. They don't have to bounce around in the cytoplasm to find each other. Another example is uh, rabies virus which 
is assembled in inclusions in the cell. And these are called Negri bodies, again, by the person who first uh, discovered them. And these are typically observed in neurons, the main uh, target for the pathology of rabies, of course. Here's on the right is a, a section of a brain of, of uh, a host that's been in the, infected with um, rabies virus. And here in the middle is a neuron. And you can tell by its uh, pyramidal shape. And it is dying because it's infected with uh, rabies virus. And then, therefore, there's space around it. And that's not good. You don't want to have space. You don't want your brain to look like a sponge. There are many diseases that cause spongiform alterations of the brain. Rabies virus, you can see here. And, of course, the destruction of neurons is not good. But this in neuron, the nucleus, the nucleus is shrinking. There's space around the nucleus. not good either. And you see these slightly darker red staining areas in the cytoplasm. Those are Negri bodies. Those are where virus reproduction is occurring. And um, the, if, if you didn't know, you could look at these and say, hmm, this looks like rabies virus cause, because some of these uh, inclusion bodies and factories are quite specific for the, at least the family of viruses. So we concentrate uh, things to make reactions go more efficiently. Viral proteins also have addresses to make sure they get to the right place in the cell. There are, for example, um, signals that have proteins go to membranes, membrane targeting signals. And we will talk about two different kinds today. There are signal sequences. These are protein sequences at the end terminus, typically, of a protein, which direct the protein uh, to a membrane. And then there are also fatty acid modifications that can make a protein stick to a membrane. We'll talk about both of these today. There are also membrane retention signals. Sometimes the protein needs to stay in a particular membrane. For example, could be it is typically synthesized in the um, ER of the cell, a membrane protein. And then is sh many of them are shipped up to the plasma membrane, but sometimes the protein needs to stay in the ER, the endoplasmic reticulum, and an ER retention signal is for that. You've, you've heard about retention packages for people who are, you know, saying, I want to leave for this other company. and say, oh, we'll give you a retention package. <laughs> well, proteins have retention signals, but they don't involve money or other things. We have nuclear localization sequences, NLSs, that get proteins into the nucleus. And on the bottom is an illustration of two different kinds of those. So these are uh, amino acids. These little ovals are individual amino acids in a protein. This is actually SV40T antigen, which you've heard about quite a bit so far, right? And this, this T antigen, of course, is made in the cytosol like every other protein, but it needs to get in the nucleus to participate in DNA replication and transcription. And so it has a nuclear localization si signal, which is a very simple one, con consisting of PKKK, RKV. Hydrophobic, three to seven basic amino acids, hydrophobic, actually. So it's kind of a general NLS. And this interacts with components of the nuclear import machinery, and it will get into the nucleus. We also we have a little more complicated signals. This is a nuclear localization signal for a cellular protein called nucleoplasmin. It's, it's simply longer. Now you can take these sequences and put them in other proteins and get them into the nucleus. So they're quite simple. And we have nuclear export signals, right? You can get into the nucleus, but if you want to get out, you need an export signal. You need a ticket to get in and a ticket to get out. And yes, the export signal uh, specifies interactions with the nuclear export machinery, which is, again, a series of proteins that move cargo through the nuclear pore. So let's look at some examples of localization of viral proteins to the nucleus. Here is a cell uh, with our nucleus, endoplasmic reticulum there, and then we have the Golgi apparatus. Uh, and uh, this cell uh, shows what happens for a number of different viruses. Um, we have, for example, uh, 
a polyomavirus, the structural proteins, the, the virion proteins here forming a pentamer, this, these proteins are made in the cytoplasm. They have nuclear localization signals, and they are imported into the nucleus. Why? Well, that's where the DNA is replicating, and so that's where the virus particles are assembled. Adenovirus uh, L4 protein, it's, a, it's eventually going to become a hexon. It's translated in the cytoplasm. It is oligomerized and then is imported into the nucleus to participate in assembly of virus particles. Parvovirus, capsid protein, also made in the cytosol, imported. Uh, and the influenza virus, nuclear protein. Remember, influenza virus is an unusual RNA virus in that it reproduces in the nucleus. But most RNA viruses stay in the cytosol. Uh, but uh, the nuclear protein needs to be in the nucleus. And so it has a nuclear localization signal to mediate that. All these proteins have nuclear localization signals to get them into the nucleus. If you take out those signals, the proteins remain in the cytoplasm. And then, of course, they can't participate in, in the case of influenza virus RNA synthesis or in the case of these other viruses, assembly of infectious virus particles. There are also signals for uh, localizing proteins to various membranes, as shown in this cell. So here now you see that uh, many proteins that are destined for the plasma membrane or, in fact, intermediate uh, destinations, um, they are produced in the endoplasmic reticulum. This is called the rough endoplasmic reticulum because it's studded with ribosomes. And the mRNA is, is uh, red on the ribosome. And then the protein, which is destined for a membrane, is inserted into the lumen of the ER. Instead of just being made and released in the cytoplasm, uh, these proteins are made in the ER of, of the plasma membrane, and they're directed there by a signal sequence at the end terminus of the protein, a very hydrophobic sequence of about 30 amino acids. Uh, and then these proteins end up anchored uh, in the ER, and they can be put on the plasma membrane, they would do so by a vesicular transport system. Here you see a vesicle has pinched off from the ER, which contains these proteins. That vesicle will then move through the Golgi, a series of what we call stacks, which are simply membrane, elongated membrane structures. And this vesicle would fuse with, with one, uh, and then the proteins would be in the Golgi, and then it would Another vesicle would be produced and so forth. And eventually the final vesicle uh, would move via the microtubule system to the plasma membrane. And that, that uh, viral protein or cell protein would end up on the surface of the cell at the plasma membrane. And so if it's a viral protein, a glycoprotein or a spike, then of course the viral RNA and other viral proteins would coalesce with it to assemble uh, viral proteins, viral particles. Now, another key com uh, concept about virus assembly, virus making virus particles, is the synthesis of what we call subassemblies. This is widely seen among different viruses. And that is, we don't make the virus particle all at once. We, we usually make parts and then assemble them together. And so, subassemblies involve the formation of discrete intermediate structures. And an example is shown here for this bacteriophage. You know, the end result is a tailed bacteriophage with an icosahedral head, a helical tail, and tail fibers. But um, look, what, look at the different subassemblies that are made. First of all, to make the tail, well, first we assemble a base plate. And all these numbers are different proteins that go into the assembly of the structures, of the components. Base plate. Uh, and then we make this tubular structure, which then gets surrounded by an additional protein to make the tail. And meanwhile, the head is assembled, the icosahedral capsid, the DNA genome is put into it, and that's added to the tail. And then separately, we make tail fibers in a series of reactions, which are then added. So this is kind of like an assembly line for a car, right? Um, uh, you, everyone adds a little part along the way, although subassembly, I, I guess we don't make subassemblies. I'm not sure how car assembly lines work. If you make a door somewhere else and then put it on, I suppose so. But the reason this is done, we think, 
is that ensures orderly formation of the particles. What, what does that mean? Well, I think the most important reason for this is that it, it enables quality control. So if you make a defective tail up here at the beginning, it never gets into the, the virus proteins. Uh, if it, it folds improperly, it will be taken out of this assembly line. So quality control is really the reason to have subassemblies so that, you know, if you put it all together at once, then you have a, fine, a final particle with a defective protein. This way, you can eliminate the defective proteins along the way. And you may say, well, what's eliminating the defective proteins? Well, those are the chaperones that can sense misfolding of proteins and, in, uh, and then they're directed to degradation pathways. You can make uh, subassemblies in a number of ways in infected cells. For example, here we have an, the assembly of a subassembly <laughs> from individual protein molecules. So here's our subassembly. It's an SV40 pentamer, five copies of VP1. And it's a subassembly because it's not the complete virus particle. And that's made by producing individual copies of VP1 by translation of the right mRNA on ribosomes, and then those assemble. There's also another minor protein here, VP2-3, which is in the middle of this pentamer, and the uh, VP2-3 is made separately. So assembly from individual protein molecules. A second strategy is to make a subassembly from a polyprotein precursor. So all the, these two proteins at the top here, we make individually. We have an mRNA that encodes them. But a polyprotein encodes a longer protein that is eventually chopped up by proteases to form the individual proteins, and that we call a polyprotein. So here, for poliovirus, we are producing the capsid protein precursor. We translate the viral RNA to make a protein that consists of VP1, VP3, uh, and VP2 and VP4, all together. These will then fold, and subsequently they're cleaved uh, by a virus-encoded protease called 3CD-PRO. And now we have a subassembly that will go on to be um, a part of the virus protein. So someone is asking what these numbers are. The, the, the phage people just gave numbers to the proteins. So this is protein 9 and 19. So, you know, it doesn't tell you anything about the function. Uh, here, at least, the proteins are called VPs, virion proteins. So it tells you it's a structural protein. But that doesn't often happen. And then finally, another way to make a subassembly is called chaperone-assisted, where here the component of what's going to be the hexon, which is the subassembly for adenovirus, is protein 2. Uh, this is produced individually. And then there's a viral chaperone called the L400 kilodalton protein that helps this protein assemble into trimers. So even though the protein's made individually, its assembly into a trimer requires a chaperone, so that makes it slightly distinct. And as I mentioned, there are also cellular chaperones that assist in assembly reactions. Seems strange, but not really, right, because... Viruses are totally dependent on the host cell for many things. And so at the top, we're looking at the assembly of a retrovirus, at least part of it. We'll see the whole story in a bit. But here, the precursor to the structural proteins of retroviruses is called GAG, group antigen, was what it was named years ago. And so the GAG protein is made initially as a polyprotein precursor, and then with the assistance of a very large cellular chaperone called TRIC, uh, it folds into what looks like a subunit that's going to go into the virus particle. So that is a, uh, a subunit, and then we're going to put many of those into the particle. And you can see as we add more and more subunits, we're getting a curved uh, shell-like structure, uh, and then eventually the virus RNA is inserted. But this, so this is dependent, this series of reaction is dependent on two chaperones, trick, and then ABCE1 is another cellular chaperone that helps to assemble these subunits uh, into the growing virus particle in an energy-dependent reaction. We'll, we'll see, we'll clarify this uh, a bit later. 
And of course, polyomavirus down at the bottom here. Uh, we've already made a subassembly, right, of a five copies of a VP1 and one copy of VP2 slash 3. In order for this to assemble into a virus capsid, another uh, two, two chaperones are needed, a, a cell chaperone called HSC70 and large T antigen. Boy, does that protein do a lot of things, right? And these help the pentamers assemble into uh, virus capsids. So those are assembly reactions that proceed by intermediates. Uh, poliovirus also does this in a very nicely characterized series of reactions. Uh, remember that the th this slide is showing the entire reproduction cycle, but let's pick it up where the RNA is in the cytoplasm. It's translated to a long polyprotein, and then the polyprotein is chopped up by virus-encoded proteases, and that structural unit is um, here, the uh, 5S structural unit, which consists of a copy of VP1, VP2, VP3, and VP4. So that's a sub-assembly. And then uh, f those assemble into pentamers next. So five of these sub-assemblies fold into another sub-assembly, which is a pentamer. And then the pentamers coalesce with genomic RNA. Twelve pentamers then uh, coalesce with a single copy of RNA to form the uh, capsid of the particle. Uh, this is called the provirion. It's not infectious until... The final cleavage occurs of VP0 to VP4 plus 2. And then we have uh, infectious virus particles. So a series of uh, sequential capsid events. And what does that last cleavage, we actually don't know. It's been a mystery for years. Uh, herpes virus is another great example of sequential capsid assembly. Remember that uh, the this is a very large capsid, which also has an envelope, but we're looking at the assembly of the capsid here in the nucleus. Now, in the nucleus, of course, this is where the viral DNA reproduces, and uh, the capsid proteins are all made in the cytoplasm, and they're imported into the nucleus, so they all have nuclear localization signals, and these include um, all these proteins that are labeled here, including a portal, right? There's going to be one of those per capsid. And the way this works is that first you make a procapsid by assembling pentamers and hexamers, typical icosahedral capsid. We also have triplexes of three pro of these proteins here that are in between, presumably to give some stability to the capsid. And because this is so large, it's unstable unless there's a protein scaffold inside of it. So a protein scaffold is actually made consisting of uh, VP2421. These are all viral proteins which holds the capsid in place as it's being assembled. Uh, so think of this as a scaffold. You know, typically you see scaffolds on the outside of buildings, which uh, the workers stand on to, to build the building. Well, here the scaffold is internal. Now, we have to get rid of this scaffold, right, because the DNA needs to go in here. So it's, it's very, very uh, elegant. Uh, the... Um, there's a protease encoded in the scaffold, and somehow once the capsid is complete, a signal is transmitted to the protease to chop the scaffold up, uh, and then genomic DNA can go in and replace the, the bits of the scaffolding amino acids. So the capsid assembled in the nucleus on a internal scaffold, scaffold removed, replaced with DNA. So these scaffolds are transient. Right? They are transient intermediate structures, and the proteases are packaged in these intermediate structures, and they become activated to finalize the structure. What happens to the rest of this, we'll see today. Now, a slightly different approach is that um, some viruses undergo what we call concerted assembly. Now, this is not to say that there are no sub-assemblies here, but the key here is that for concerted assembly, the particles assembly only in association with the viral genome in the normal reproduction cycle. So here we have influenza virus infected cell, and the uh, RNAs have been reproduced in the nucleus. They're exported out of the nucleus via the nuclear pore. Uh, 
these viral proteins that are attached to the RNA have nuclear export sequences on them. Uh, and then at the same time, the viral glycoproteins are translated on the rough ER. They're shipped up uh, by the fascicular transport system to the plasma membrane. And there, uh, the RNA interacts with them, and a virus particle is formed by budding. So think of it concerted all at once. The virus particle forms by association of the nucleic acid uh, at the site where the glycoproteins are. So the there are certainly subassemblies, right? There are the RNAs, the RNPs, the ribonuclear protein is a subassembly. The spike glycoproteins are subassembly. But then to make the virus particle it happens all at once by coalescing of the RNA and the formation of, a, of an envelope particle. We call that concerted assembly. The particles assemble only in association with the genome. Let's take a closer look at the uh, influenza virus components. So here's the schematic of the virus particle that we've seen before. It's an envelope particle with eight, a segmented RNA genome consisting of eight pieces. And there are, of course, uh, ribonucleoproteins. They're RNA joined with nucleoprotein in the polymerase complex. This uh, virus is enveloped. Beneath the envelope is a viral protein uh, called the matrix or M1 protein, which gives the envelope some stability. And then there are virus spike proteins um, inserted into the membrane of the cell. And those proteins include the hemagglutinin uh, and the neuraminidase. And the hemagglutinin, of course, is the protein that binds to the cellular receptor. The neuraminidase is the enzyme that cleaves the receptor from cells. And uh, we'll, we'll talk about that, uh, that the, the requirement of that later. Seems like a contradiction or a paradox, as Rich Condit said on the last TWIV. And, and if you listen to that, you'll get an explanation now of what that neuraminidase does. But here's the hemagglutinin structure, a, uh, a type 1 fusion protein in the membrane of the virus, perpendicular to the membrane, and with a fibrous stem and a globular head, which binds uh, sialic acid. Now, here in the bottom is a line diagram of the HA protein. So you can see... There is a transmembrane sequence that anchors the protein in a membrane. Could be the viral membrane, could be a cell me plasma membrane. There's a short sequence in the cytosol of the cell or in the interior of the virus particle. And then the bulk of the HA is outside. So at the end terminus, there's a signal sequence. And that, of course, um, would uh, get this protein into the endoplasmic reticulum. And the signal sequence is actually removed once the protein's in the ER and the, um, the native protein in the particle doesn't have a signal sequence any longer. Then you see an extended red line. That's the HA protein sequence. And a few features I want to point out. First of all, here's the fusion peptide here. And so remember that to fuse with cells, this fusion peptide has to be exposed. And so the first step is to cleave the protein right here. This orange arrowhead is a cleavage site for typical uh, airway cell proteases that um, are present in your respiratory tract. They will cleave this. And then uh, at low pH, uh, the end terminus will flip up and, and insert into the host cell membrane and lead to fusion, a, a process we talked about quite a bit uh, when we talked about attachment and entry. But I just wanted to show you that this fusion peptide is quite internal. Now, when it's cleaved, the 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 rest of the HA, which is called um, HA1. So HA0 is the name for the whole protein before it's cleaved. Then when we cleave it here, we get HA1 and HA2. HA1 doesn't fall off. It's different from the coronavirus spike where cleavage, the, the, uh, the, the first half, S1, falls off. Here, HA1 is held on to HA2 by a disulfide bond. What's a disulfide bond? Well, uh, certain amino acids like cysteine have sulfur groups. And two cysteines, if they're close together, the, the sulfur can form a covalent bond. It's called a disulfide bond. And it will hold uh, HA1 and HA2 together. So you can see this particular one. Uh, between this amino acid at the right and this one at the left, that will hold the HA1 and the HA2 together um, so that later on the, the fusion event will happen. Now, this protein is made uh, in a series of steps shown here. 
So HA0 is the precursor to the HA, right? It is made in the rough endoplasmic reticulum. Uh, and um, the protein ends up being inserted into the ER and it is attached by a transmembrane sequence. Uh, this protein is also, so here's the transmembrane sequence shown as a, a spring there. And there's also a modification of the C-terminus of the protein with a fatty acid uh, that uh, makes the C-terminus stick into the membrane as well. And that seems to be important for assembly. Uh, the rest of the protein here is in the lumen uh, of the ER. And then it will eventually move up to the plasma membrane through the Golgi network by a series of vesicles transporting the glycoproteins. Uh, and this is called, again, the, the, cis, the Golgi network. It, it, it's divided functionally into cis, trans, uh, and cis, medial, and trans compartments that have slightly different activities and compositions. But as the influenza HA moves through it, it's typical of many glycoproteins, uh, different reactions occur. For example, uh, oligomerization of the HA occurs here. It becomes a trimer. Uh, sugars are added uh, and then trimmed back until the final protein uh, you can see here uh, has a variety of sugars shown by those black lines. And there are the disulfide bonds holding HA1 and 2 together. Now, this picture shows cleavage of uh, HA0, which typically does not happen in the ER. And, and for some influenza viruses, it can, but for most human influenza viruses, the, cleavage, the, the protein is produced without cleavage, and then it's cleaved extracellularly in the respiratory tract. And we'll talk about that um, later when we talk about pathogenesis. Okay, so now let us take a, um, a pause here for a quiz. And the first question is, subassemblies are involved in which of the following types of virus particle production? Concerted assembly, sequential assembly, assembly lines, chaperone-assisted assembly, or all of the above? And while you are chewing on that, let's take some uh, questions here. And let's see where we have to go. A lot of chat in the beginning that's cool. All right, let's see. When classes 3, 4, and 5 go to plus, is that also called transcription? So transcription is only the ma making of mRNA from DNA, in my book anyway. In the book is Principles of Virology, right? So um, I wouldn't call it transcription. It's just mRNA synthesis. Uh, is there a difference between DNA replication and DNA synthesis? Not really, no. For DNA, if you're making copies, well, uh, if you are repairing, say, a gapped DNA, that would be DNA repair carrying out by DNA synthesis. I wouldn't call it DNA replication because you're not making more. So DNA replication is a form of DNA synthesis where you're making copies of the DNA genome. Is there a reason why DNA viruses assemble in the nucleus? Uh, so that's a good question, and we don't know. Most DNA viruses do assemble in the nucleus. Maybe it's easier to get the proteins in rather than the DNA out, as you suggest. To get the DNA out, it would have to bind a protein, and we don't really see that happening for, for assembly. It's interesting. Um, I, I, the reason is, is really unknown. It's a good question. There may be other reasons that we're unaware of. Now, of course, some viruses like Pox viruses do assemble in the cytoplasm, but they make everything in the cytoplasm. They're independent of the nucleus. Viral proteins have addresses and hijack normal processes. I finally understand why there's so many delays in shipping. Yes, <laughs> it's a complicated process. So is, is, it is the presence of these chaperones that make cells permissive. Well, they certainly contribute to permissivity, right? They're one of many different aspects of a cell that's needed for permissivity. It includes that. It includes, uh, you know, being translated effectively and having various enzymes. But yes, it's part of the whole picture for sure. Oh, this is a good point. Arches have internal formers. Yes, there are also internal arches like we saw with herpes simplex virus. 
uh, is the stack of genomic subunits really as neatly stacked? Actually, you will see later, uh, they, they're quite aligned. They're actually parallel, yeah. Um, we we'll have a picture of that coming in. Does any DNA virus transport the DNA to the cytoplasm? Uh, we, yeah, we answered that. I'm not aware of any, no. And I don't know why um, that doesn't happen, but apparently it is uh, not something that happens there. All right, let's uh, go back to the quiz. Here's one more question that just popped in. May there, maybe there is a critically low level of ATP that allows cells to stay alive but blocks assembly. Um, I'm not sure what you're meaning there. I know that you can sequester NTPs, and, as, and there are antiviral proteins that do that. Yes. Could you explain neuraminidase? Uh, no, SARS-CoV-2 doesn't encode a neuraminidase because its receptor is not sialic acid. Uh, sialic acids are present all over a cell, and so a neuraminidase is needed to cleave them from the surface of the cell so the virus particles made can float away, and they don't just stick to new sialic acids on the cell surface. All right. In designation of influenza virus like H5N1, uh, they are just antigenic types. There are you know, one through, I think there are 18 or 19 hemagglutinins and almost as many neuraminidases, which are antigenically defined. Um, but yes, this is a unique to influenza viruses, pretty much. Um, we'll talk more about that later. In my day, chaperones were supposed to prevent too much assembly. Yes. Well, this is a different kind of chaperone, right? Yeah, this is a good point. All right, let's check out the quiz here. Uh, what do we have? So the answer is uh, all of the above. What are involved? Um, in Subassemblies are involved in which? Concerted, sequential, assembly lines, chaperone-assisted. So I don't want you to think that these other methods have no, no subassemblies. There's always a subassembly. You always make some parts and put them together, sometimes multiple stages as we saw for the bacteriophages. So concerted and sequential, they all are involving subassemblies, assembly lines, etc. So they're all correct. Now an important part of assembly is to get the nucleic acid in, right? And that's called genome packaging. That's the word we use. And the problem, of course, is we have to put in viral nucleic acid, not cellular nucleic acid, either viral RNA or viral DNA. You don't want cellular DNA. You don't want cellular RNA, at least not the bulk of what's in there. Some viruses do package small bits of cellular nucleic acids, right? So uh, can you think of an example of a virus that packages a nucleic acid? Uh, you should know that because we just talked about it, but I'll let you answer. Anyway, the solution to this problem, to getting virus nucleic acid in, this, in the virus particle, is a packaging signal in the viral genome. So the problem is called packaging, or the process is called genome packaging, and we have packaging signals in viral genomes. So what's a packaging signal? Well, they're present in both DNA and RNA genomes, here at the top are two examples of packaging sequences in, in two of our favorite viruses in this course, adenovirus and SV40. So here's a diagram of the, the left end of adenovirus DNA, double-stranded DNA, an inverted terminal repeat at each end, the origin of replication right there at the end. And here is the first transcriptional unit and the initiation site for transcription, the red arrow. And here are the packaging sequences around base 300. They are short repeated sequences, which are essential uh, to getting the viral DNA exclusively into the capsid. And they, these packaging signals interact with viral proteins. So 
It's a complex packaging signal here. It's a set of repeated sequences. As you see, they overlap with enhancers. So often signals of these sorts are, are compressed into one area of the genome. We talked about that for origins of replication and transcription. Now we see packaging sequences. And in the case of adenovirus, these packaging sequences interact with the viral protein 4A2, and that's what gets the DNA into the capsid. So this is a key point about uh, packaging signals. They often interact with viral proteins that are essential for getting the capsids made. So that's adenovirus here, and the bottom is SV40 packaging signal. Again, uh, here's uh, here's the origin of replication. There's base 1 slash 5, 2, 4, 3. Remember, the genome is circular. Early transcription unit, enhancer of the early transcription unit, and there are a series of uh, repeated packaging signals, again, that are needed to bind a viral protein. And these signals um, are essential for getting the viral genome into this, the particle. If you take them out, then you don't get packaging. You can remove these packaging sequences, uh, and um, then you will um, not get nucleic acid in the particle. Now, someone is asking, are the packaging sequences always non-coding? The ones I'm showing you are. There are so many viruses for which we haven't identified packaging sequences, and so it's possible that they overlap with um, coding regions, right? So the packaging sequence itself functions as a nucleic acid. It binds a, a structural protein. Uh, but there's no reason why it has to be in. These are in non-coding regions here, but they could be in coding regions as well. Here's an example of uh, the packaging signal uh, for um, herpes virus. This is very cool. It solves a number of issues you may have thought of since we've been talking about herpes virus. Remember, the viral DNA replicates as a rolling circle, and you make concatomers, which means long molecules with multiple genomes all stuck together in them like toilet paper, right? And eventually, uh, these need to be processed, and they actually get processed to, during the packaging step. Uh, the genome that is present in the virus particle is shown here, and there are repeated sequences at either end, and particularly this A sequence is the same sequence at either end. And there's the packaging sequence within it. It um, consists of a number of elements, PAC1 and PAC2, that's packaging, and DR1, DR2, direct repeat 1 and 2. So that is the packaging sequence. Uh, and so how this works is shown on the right. Here we have an empty capsid, which is made in the nucleus by the process I showed you, where we have um, a scaffold built inside of the shell, and then the scaffold's removed, and then the DNA needs to get in. And the DNA gets in through the portal. There's one portal on each capsid, and that's shown here. And here's a, here's a uh, closer view of the portal. And the portal is made up of a number of proteins, and... It's also associated with a number of other viral proteins here, green, red, and white, with cryptic names. But what happens is this assembly of, of viral proteins recognizes the packaging signal. So the this DR1, PAC1, DR2, PAC2, these interact with these proteins specifically. All right? And, and you're, we're interacting with a concatomer, so there's more than one genome here. The next thing that happens is that there's a motor built into the portal that winds the DNA into the capsid. And it winds it in and stuffs it in there at very high pressure, hundreds of pounds per square inch. It's really remarkable. Uh, and then how does it know when to stop? When it reaches, when the portal reaches another packaging signal. So the packaging signal in this genome is shown as this colored bar with all these different colors representing the PACs and the DRs. And when a second packaging signal is reached, there is a endonuclease associated with the portal that cleaves the DNA, and now you have a head full of DNA. So one packaging signal to the other determines when to stop putting DNA in, and now you have another uh, piece of DNA left that could be packaged into another virus particle. So you have very, very long concatomers of genomes, and they're put in one by one like this. I think this is quite um, 
remarkable. Uh, and again, this is put in a very high pressure so that when this particle infects the next cell um, and docks uh, onto the nuclear pore, this DNA comes shooting out into the nucleus. And so that's how D herpes virus DNA is packaged and how we get from a concatamer to a single molecule of DNA in the virus particle. Now, of course, RNA viruses also have packaging signals. They haven't been identified for all RNA viruses, but they have been for many retroviruses. So that's the example or one example I'm going to show you here. And so here we have uh, at the bottom in green the left end of the HIV mRNA. So that's the initiating AUG there. Uh, and um, remember the primer binding site, that's where the tRNA would be bound. Uh, and here is the packaging sequence shown by psi, the Greek letter psi. That's the packaging sequence, which is necessary but not sufficient for genome packaging. You need some other sequences in the genome as well. But if you take out this psi sequence, you will not get packaging. Now within that psi, the RNA is extensively structured into stem loops, as you can see here. They're called stem loop 1, 2, 3, and 4. And previously, we talked about how stem loop 1, the loop, can base pair between two different two R copies of this HIV RNA. And so that gets two copies of the genome into the particle. Uh, and then the, the other part of this is that part of this sequence, which is formed actually when the RNAs interact, then binds the nucleocapsid protein. And so here on the right at the top is the gag precursor, matrix, capsid, nucleocapsid. These are the structural proteins of the virus. In the nucleocapsid, that's the RNA binding protein, uh, there are sequences uh, for that bind the RNA specifically. These two boxes here, specific RNA binding. So what happens is this... this GAG protein has a precursor. Here it's shown here, matrix, capsid, nucleocapsid in blue, red, and yellow. It binds the RNA. So the nucleocapsid, the yellow, binds the RNA and pulls the two RNAs in. And the two RNAs are stuck on each other by this kissing loop. And the packaging sequence here interacts with nucleocapsid, which uh, then brings the uh, whole particle the nucleic acid into the particle. And actually how this works, we're going to see in a bit because so far here we have you know, two molecules of GAG and two molecules of RNA. How does it make a virus particle? Stay tuned. We'll talk about that. Now for segmented genomes, the there is uh, more of a problem in that how do you get all of the correct sequences into the particle? You got to have, for example, for influenza virus, you need eight segments. And if you don't have eight, if you have seven, you won't be infectious. So segmented genomes have a particular problem. Um, and there are two ways that we think that this happens. First, it, it could be that for some viruses, they just assemble randomly. So for influenza virus, where you need eight of the right segments, Right? eight unique RNA segments to make an infectious particle, a random assembly mechanism where the virus just grabbed eight segments from the pool in the cytoplasm, that would give you one infectious particle per 400 particles assembled. So th 399 wouldn't have the right number, but one would out of 400, which in turn, it turns out to be close or within the known uh, particle to PFU ratio of this uh, virus. So for many years, people thought it was random for influenza virus. But it turns out there are specific packaging sequences on each RNA segment of influenza virus. And so here is a diagram on the lower right of the eight different RNA segments, each encoding a protein or two. Here's hemagglutinin or aminidase, uh, uh, the M protein, nuclear protein. Each RNA segment has at both the five and three prime ends a specific packaging sequence, which differs among the eight segments. And so here you can see PB2 has 120 base packaging sequence at either end. You could stick that onto HA. You could swap them 
and they would still work on another segment. But each segment has to have a unique packaging sequence. And so this packaging sequence interacts with viral proteins during packaging, and it also interacts among the eight RNAs to get the right eight RNAs uh, into the virus particle. So we have RNA, RNA, and RNA protein interactions. And, and here uh, I have um, given you an example. You can swap the HA and the NA signals. This was done uh, in a laboratory, and the virus still works as long as you have the unique um, packaging signals. Now, someone asked earlier, uh, how do these RNAs look? And in fact, if you do an electron micrograph of an influenza virus preparation, uh, you can see that the RNAs are, are oriented parallel to one another. Okay, so you could see, you could count, in each of these particles, you could count uh, eight RNAs. And so what's thought to happen is that these, each of these RNPs, so it's an RNA joined to proteins, align with each other and with viral proteins in the, in the membrane, possibly the, the, uh, the matrix protein and the, the glycoproteins, and you have those RNA sequences mediating this interaction among the eight correct segments and also with the particle, and so then it buds off, and that's why you get this orientation uh, in the final particle. So there is specific uh, uh, packaging signals in each RNA, unique to each RNA segment. Now, for other segmented viruses, uh, there's even a more sophisticated mechanism. I guess it's not more sophisticated. It's just different. Um, it's called selective packaging. And this is an example from a bacteriophage called Phi6, uh, which is um, a bacteriophage that has three double-stranded RNA segments in it, very much like a real virus, but just with three segments. They're called S, M, and L. And here's the virus particle. It's a double-membraned particle like real viruses, outer capsid, inner capsid, and they're the three double-stranded RNAs. This uh, virus shows a serial dependence of packaging. What does that mean? Well, first, the sRNA is packaged, presumably, and these are all presumably mediated by RNA protein interactions. S always goes in first, not M, not L. Next, M goes in only if S is, pr is present, okay? S first, M next, and then when those two are in, L goes in. So it is a serial or selective mechanism, whereas you put, have to put one segment in first, then the second will go in, and then the third. And those are presumably based on RNA protein interactions, but uh, apparently it's very efficient because the particle to PFU ratio of this virus is about one. That means it almost every particle that's made is infectious. And maybe it's because of this selective packaging mechanism. Maybe others are more prone to error. Okay, time for another, another quiz. Next question is, packaging signals on viral blank interact with viral blank during virus assembly. And you have to fill in the blanks. Lipids, proteins, proteins, subassemblies, genomes, proteins, proteases, membranes, proteins, genomes. And let's have a look at some quiz questions. Oh, I forgot to mark the last one. Hmm. All right, I, I kind of know where it was, yes. Car production definitely uses subassemblies. Good. Good to know. And Tom got the right answer. Yes, retroviruses package tRNAs, and other viruses do other things, but they're minor components of the particle. So we could take random nucleic acid sequences, insert packaging sequences, add purified structure, and we can deliver any DNA sequence we wish. Sure, yes, if you know the packaging sequence, you could do that. And this is, in part, the basis for gene therapy using viruses, right? The packaging sequence is key, and we're going to talk about that in the last session of this course. Yep.
blows my mind seeing these mo- machines with rotors. From macroscopic experience, we feel that organisms are at least elastically attached. Not so. Yeah, they form all these things that look to us like motors. And you should see the electron transport chain in a mitochondria. Boy, talk about rotors and generators. It's amazing. Is stem RNA like a small piece of DNA? No, it's different. It has a different way of folding. These stem loops, they have a different fold from DNA. You know, DNA has a major groove and a minor groove, and that's not the case with RNA. So more like a bundle, not my comparison. Yeah, the a clip, I guess, would be all flat, right? Yeah, so this is more like a bundle. Yep. It looks like it is by chance, but it is all directed. Yes, not a lot of chance involved, although there are random encounters that govern this whole thing. But once the encounters are made, then there's a lot of order to it. Do we know why flu has such a high particle to PFU if it's not random packaging? Uh, No, we actually don't know for most viruses why the particle to PFU is high. Really, very little insight into that really important question. Could a virus enter a dead cell? Uh, it depends. If it had the receptor and if endocytosis were still happening, if that virus needs endocytosis, it could, but then that would be the end of it. It would not reanimate the cell. No, not happening. It sounds cool, but it doesn't happen. Is the removal of packaging signals used to create virus-like particle? No, you just make the capsid proteins in a system without the full nucleic acid. And you use the mRNA encoding the capsid proteins, which wouldn't have a packaging sequence. So I guess in a sense, yes, <laughs> you're right. Oh, Vanity, welcome. Missed you earlier. You need more mitochondria. Yeah, we all do. Mitochondria used to be bacteria, right? Isn't that cool? Okay, I'm going to mark that as our last question. And let's go check out what we've done here. On our quiz, yes, packaging signals of viral genomes interact with viral proteins during virus assembly. That's the right combinations, not lipid proteins. It's not proteins, subassemblies. It's not proteins and genomes. Let's talk about how some viruses get a membrane or envelope. Two ways, after assembly of internal structures, most envelope viruses, so you make the nuclear capsid and then it's enveloped. Sometimes it's simultaneous with the assembly of internal structures, which occurs for retroviruses. So here are four examples across viruses, uh, different ways this occurs. So for some viruses, You can produce just the envelope and the capsid protein, and it will make a particle. You don't need the genome. You could just produce individually envelope and capsid. Here's the envelope glycoprotein in red, the capsid in red, in uh, yellow. And this will drive the production of a particle. So they have all the synthesis um, of... uh, They they drive the synthesis of particles. They have all the information needed. Now... For some viruses, the matrix proteins, those are the blue ones here. Those are the the form the shell underneath the membrane, which gives the particle some stability. Um, They can drive budding or the the capsid protein. So for retroviruses, if you just produce GAG, the precursor, you can make virus particles in the absence of genomes and, of course, in the absence of glycoproteins. And that's a foundation for gene therapy, which we'll talk about later. Uh, for some viruses, just the envelope proteins are needed, are, ne- are enough to make a particle. Influenza virus, coronaviruses, you just produce the hemagglutinin or the spike and you get a particle. And that's the basis for influenza virus vaccines made in plants, for example, or insect cells. We'll talk about that later. So you can make a virus-like particle with just the spike. And finally, for some viruses, the matrix proteins will drive budding, but other components make it more efficient and accurate. 
Um, so interesting division of budding or formation of a particle. So let's look at budding now in some detail. Uh, here is influenza virus budding. Remember, this is concerted assembly. As someone said before, it's really a symphony, isn't it? We have our ribonucleoproteins coming to the plasma membrane where they interact with the uh, spike proteins, the hemagglutinin and the neuraminidase, which have already been transported to the plasma membrane by the transport pathway of the cell, right? These uh, glycoproteins are made on the rough ER, the neuraminidase, the hemagglutinin, and the ion channel also is a membrane protein. They're all transported by vesicular traffic to the plasma membrane. And then the ribonucleoprotein, eight of them, of course, you need eight. They interact via the packaging sequences. And then via budding, this is the process we've been referring to as budding, we have a new virus particle formed at the plasma membrane of the cell. So how does uh, this budding business work? So first of all, you need to get the, <laughs> the genomes to the right place in the cell, right? So here is uh, a close-up look of that for influenza virus. Here's one RNA segment, but this has to happen with eight. And remember, uh, this, this RNA segment is perpendicular to the membrane, at least in terms of the electron micrographs, as I showed you before. And so the, the, how does the RNP interact with the membrane? Well, here, here at the bottom are, are line diagrams of the protein. Here's the influenza virus M1 protein. That is that blue protein, which is shown as, as rectangles here. And uh, in the virus particle blue, it's the protein that's beneath the membrane gives the particle some stability. But the M1 protein has uh, a number of regions that are important for this step. First, uh, they ha it has a, a part that binds to the RNA. And so that's why the M1 protein is stuck on the RNA here. And that, that sticking onto the RNA happens in the nucleus. So the M1 protein is made in the cytoplasm. Then it has a nuclear localization signal to get it in the nucleus, where it then binds to the RNA via this sequence down here. And then there's a nuclear export sequence to get the RNP bound to M1 out of the nucleus. And then finally, it has a region that is hydrophobic and is involved in membrane binding. So that is how the RNP binds to the plasma membrane. So the M1 protein is driving all of this movement. Really quite remarkable by all of these sequences. And you may ask, oh, how do we know this? People have systematically changed the coding region for this protein and looked at the effects on virus reproduction at a subcellular level. So again, the M1 is made in the cytoplasm. It gets in the nucleus by an NLS. There it binds to the RNA, which has been made in the nucleus via this sequence. It then gets out of the nucleus by a nuclear export. And finally, it binds to the membrane via these hydrophobic regions at the end terminus. The analogous protein of vesicular stomatitis, VSVM, has similar sequences. Here we have uh, a part, the end terminus happens to be involved in RNA binding, uh, and here a hydrophobic region for membrane binding. And we don't have as many details as we do for influenza virus. But this is how the genomes, in the case of these two viruses, uh, are targeted to the membrane. And let's take a look at how this is done in retrovirus infected cells because uh, it will illustrate this idea that the particles mature after they're released from the host cell. All right, so here we have a cell infected with a retrovirus. Remember, the mRNA and the genome RNA are coming out of the nucleus because the viral DNA is integrated in the host cell. It's a provirus. Transcription produces viral RNAs that are exported into the, the cytosol, and they form a dimer via those kissing interactions in the 5' prime end of the RNA, the stem loops. And then on, they're each bound to a, 
a single molecule of GAG. So what is GAG? Here again is the GAG precursor. Matrix, capsid, nucleocapsid. And then there's some other protein here, P6. What's that? Oh, we're going to look at that in a moment. Hang on. So the GAG protein is made in large quantity. It binds the RNA via specific sequences in the nucleocapsid protein or the N protein. Remember, we looked at those. So this yellow part is what directs interaction with the viral RNA. You only need two RNAs per virus particle. You don't need more than two. Now, this little assembly here, two gags with the RNA, goes up to the plasma membrane. Similar sequences as for the M protein of influenza virus. We'll look at those in a moment. And then a whole lot of gags without nucleic acid line up next to it to form uh, what eventually is going to be the budding virus particle. As you can see here, more and more gags are associating. They're all lining up here, but you only have one, two that have RNA on them. Now, what else do we need in this particle? We have, we have the structural protein. We have glycoproteins that were already up at the plasma membrane. Oh, we need reverse transcriptase and protease and integrase. Right. So those are made by making a gag Paul fusion protein. Remember, the gag is made when there's a termination codon for translation that terminates right after P6 here. But sometimes there's suppression of that terminator and you get a gag Paul fusion. And so this looks like gag with reverse transcriptase integrase. And I forgot protease, PR in white, RT in blue, integrase in orange. So it's a Polyprotein. So sometimes you get one of these polyproteins in, uh, incorporated into this uh, gag assembly. You can see there's one there and one there. And you have about 50 RT molecules per virus particle. All right, so mostly gag, but some, sometimes gag Paul. So this whole assembly eventually forms. So eventually this um, circle is completed with gag gag pole molecules. It buds from the surface. It's released from the cell. But this is not done yet. It needs to mature. So the protease encoded in the pole part of the gag pole, that white enzyme, gets working on these proteins and cleaves them all. <clears throat> you know, it's got to separate matrix and capsid and nucleocapsid, etc. And that gives you the maturation leading to the final infectious virus particle. So there it is. Now the capsid has its typical icosahedral shape. For HIV, it's, it's kind of conical, looks like, uh, but it does have symmetry to it. And then the RT uh, in, in blue and the integrase in orange and the protease in white, they've all been released. You have a nice matrix protein underneath the membrane. The capsid in red has formed the shell and the RNA is inside. So all that maturation happens after the virus buds. That's why this is unusual. So let's look at a gag and see what directs it to the plasma membrane. Remember, I told you that these gag proteins go up to the plasma membrane. What mediates that interaction? So here is gag again. Matrix is shown here at the bottom. Matrix has uh, some regions that are important for membrane binding. Those are hydrophobic regions. But they also have a very unusual modification at this N-terminal glycine where a lipid is added. It's called myristate, myristic acid. And there's a specific sequence here that specifies the addition of myristate to the protein. If you change that sequence, the myristoylation sequence, you will prevent the interaction of GAG with the cytoplasmic face of the plasma membrane, and you won't get virus particles made. So this is extremely important for targeting the GAG protein to the plasma membrane. Myristate is a lipid, so it likes to stick into lipids. And there are also hydrophobic regions of, uh, of M as well, matrix. Then we have capsid here, which will end up forming the shell around the RNA. And here at the end is nucleocapsid with our RNA binding sequences, and that's what gets the RNA into this particle. 
So isn't that a remarkable series of uh, events that happens here late in infection? Here's meristate. Uh, what it looks like, you have the, the fatty acid, and it's linked to a protein, typically a glycine, and um, the, uh, this is the meristalization signal. So this is a common occurrence uh, in many biochemical processes. The addition of a lipid, in this case, the, the addition to a viral protein will target those proteins to membranes, and you don't need a signal sequence, right? So uh, matrix does not go through the ER. It goes to plasma membrane by virtue of this lipid meristate. So these are, it's a different way to get a protein targeted to a membrane. You make the protein in the cytoplasm, then you modify it post-translationally with this lipid meristate. There are other lipids that could go on as well. And then it will go to a membrane. All right, finally, we need to talk about uh, budding. So what is this budding? Like, is there an analogous process uh, in the cell? Well, of course there is. And this was discovered a number of years ago. People were studying these GAG proteins. Here's HIV GAG, matrix, capsid, nucleocapsid. Then at the C-terminus, this was this protein called P6. People didn't know what it did. And then in murine leukemia virus GAG, uh, there was another protein called P12, which was right after GAG. And so people started... Uh, making changes, making changes in these P6 and P12 proteins. And the viruses that were made had unusual phenotypes. They had this phenotype here where the viruses would bud from the cell, but they would never detach. So budding was arrested at a late stage because it's at the end of the reproduction cycle. Uh, and they were t these particles were tethered to the membrane. So knocking out P6 or P12 caused this to happen. Well, it turns out that revealed that these viral proteins are now interacting with a host cell machinery called the escort pathway that is needed for budding. And these proteins, P6 and P12, have very specific motifs, which are shown here. They're called late domains because they affect budding. These interact with escort proteins and other members of the escort pathway to facilitate budding. And now this has been found in uh, envelope viruses of both plus and minus polarity. Of course, these have a role in the cell. These L domains, so now this P6 and P12, they're called L or late domains. They bind cells that are involved in vesicle trafficking in the cell. Uh, they're involved in cell division, mitosis, and uh, many other pathways. Now, let's see that here. So that's what ESCORT stands for. Endosomal sorting complex is required for transport. You know, when they first discovered this, they wanted to give it a cool name, so they made it up to mean ESCORT because this is helping to escort things around the cell. And the escort machinery is a series of cellular proteins, and we saw some of them here, TSG, CHIMP6, ALIX. Don't worry about the names. The key is that these in a cell, in an uninfected cell, the escort pathway is needed for various membrane activities. For example, when a cell divides, that last pinching off of the membranes, is called abscission, is mediated by escort proteins. Uh, within the cell, the formation of multifascicular bodies. So when a vesicle buds into another vesicle, it's done by the escort pathway. And so escort proteins are shown as a coil here. And then we have uh, these uh, Pac-Man-like proteins, which digest them after their job is done. So what happens here is that the virus reproduction cycle hijacks the escort pathway to form particles because this is what they need to do, right? So remember, we told you that the late domains of the structural proteins, the GAG proteins, interact with escort proteins, and they basically recruit the escort machinery to the cell surface. This spring pinches off the membrane, and we have a virus particle form. So that's how this, the viruses hijack the escort pathway in order to do budding. It's remarkable, and, and many, many viruses do this. 
Now, finally, the, um, um, this, the, the glycoproteins can go to various membranes. They don't have to just go to the plasma membrane. We've talked about um, putting spikes in at the plasma membrane. But in fact, uh, viral glycoproteins can go to almost any membrane. It's, it's always consistent within the kind of virus, but it can vary. For example, uh, herpes simplex viruses can bud into the nuclear membrane. Uh, some viruses can bud into the ER, coronaviruses, flaviviruses, vaccinia viruses. Some can bud into the Golgi, and that's in each of these places, that's where the virus particles are formed. So I've shown you budding at the plasma membrane, but in fact, you can have budding from other membrane sites as well, and therefore the virus particles will have membranes that derive from other cell sites. So let's take a look at that here for coronaviruses. Uh, these, the nucleocapsid of coronaviruses is assembled in the cytoplasm. What happens is we have the N protein, which is produced in the cytoplasm, and then genome replication makes full-length plus-stranded uh, genomes. Uh, these are encapsidated to form a nucleocapsid, which then buds into the ER Golgi intermediate compartment. So here's the ER. The Golgi is not shown here, but in between the two, is what's called the ergic, the nucleocaps, and that's where the glycoproteins, the spike and other proteins are made. That is where they are um, put into the ergic. They're not put in the plasma membrane. And then the nucleocapsid buds into the ergic, so now we have a vesicle with a mature virus particle in it. So no budding at the plasma membrane for coronaviruses. And then finally, these virus particles are released at the plasma membrane as this vesicle fuses with the plasma membrane in certainly reactions mediated by escort proteins. And that gives us the final coronavirus. And since I, I'm at home today, I wanted to show you, I'm sure some of you have seen this model of a coronavirus on, on the live streams, but if you haven't, it's just gorgeous. It was made by a company, 3D Molecular Simulations. So there's the membrane uh, in gray, and then we have the spike glycoprotein, and then there are other there are other embedded proteins in the in the coronavirus. There's this white one, and there's the blue one. There M and E proteins, okay. And then of course uh, this one is cut in half, and it has a, a simulation of an RNA here, which is some kind of a oops, it came out, it uncoded. Um, but this is just like a foam thing with some wire in it to give it some whoops. Oh boy. Anyway, these are, this is not broken. It's just uh, magnetically held together. It's very cool. Okay. We'll come back to that when we talk about antibodies actually. So that's how the uh, coronaviruses are made. And now it's time for another quiz, which I think will be our last. So which statement about, and let's get that up here. Which statement about viral budding is incorrect? A, the envelope can be acquired after or simultaneous with assembly of internal components. B, the spike glycoprotein can drive budding. C, no host proteins are involved in the budding process. D, lipids assist structural proteins to interact with the membrane. And E, the membrane can be acquired from the nucleus ER, Golgi, or plasma membrane. So have a look at that, and we will do some questions here. Let's go back. Okay. What's the most important aspect of the assembly process? It's hard to say what's the most important, but I would say getting the nucleic acid, the viral nucleic acid specifically into the particle and not cellular nucleic acids. And what is unique among all known viruses? Well, I think packaging is unique because there really isn't any cellular counterpart, right? What's controlling the timing of these signals in budding? Oh, the concentrations of the escort proteins, they're all throughout the cell. Uh, and um, as, when the viral proteins are made, the, and incorporated into the budding particle, that will recruit the escort pathway. Now, you may say, well, why don't the escort proteins interact with it you know, in the cytosol? They may, 
and it doesn't lead to any budding, but they may not interact because the conformation may not be the same as it is at the cell membrane. I'm not sure we know that. Antivirals directed against assembly. Yes, there is actually a very good one for hepatitis B virus. It's not easy to do, but there's a good one for hep B that we'll be talking about in the antiviral chapter. No human has the mental capacity, intelligence to engineer something. Absolutely not. We could not do something like this. So the idea that we can make viruses is simply observe and reflects absurd and reflects a lack of knowledge of the complexity of viral reproduction, I think. Is there an association between budding and virulence? No, not that I, I am aware of. I have seen no such associations. But of course, you need to make virus particles to be virulent, right? And that's made by budding. Could we design proteases that cleave P6? The protease that releases P6 is a viral protease. And yes, we have very good protease inhibitors, and they are one of the reasons why we can control HIV AIDS. So the capsid is the shell around the virus particle that's made up of multiple proteins arranged in a icosahedral symmetry, or if it's a nuclear capsid, it could be simply RNA coated with a protein. The matrix or M protein is the membrane underneath uh, the shell. My model here doesn't have a matrix protein, unfortunately. But if you look in those diagrams of envelope particles, it's just beneath the membrane and it's shown as a, uh, a shell. I will point it out in another picture here. Is this route the same for spike from mRNA vaccines? Mm-hmm. Well, um, that's a good question. Is it going through the ergic? Because my understanding is that um, it's, a, it's, it's displayed on the plasma membrane. So I think it's not. And if you just produce spike, it's not going through the ergic. That's a good question. I have to look into that. That's a good question. What induces the curvature of the membrane during budding? Is it, if it's from inside, then it's unusual. Yeah, so it's not it's not mediated by clathrin cop one two. It's the viral proteins that are being assembled underneath, like the matrix and the gag. In the case of retroviruses, that are pushing it out. But I I think um, we we don't really have a good understanding of that. But you take my money, give me one of what, those models? You can buy it. Molecular simulations, I think, is the name. What happens if a uh, retrovirus, while still busy maturing, binds a new receptor and enters? There is good evidence that retrovirus reproduction downregulates receptors from the cell surface to prevent just that, right? That would be a problem. Matrix does not bind protein to protein, but via the bilayer. Yes. It does both. It binds, binds the bilayer and interacts with each other for sure. And we have a lot of questions on fluvoxamine. We'll get to those in the antiviral lecture. We like to compartmentalize our um, discussions here. If you want to have a random association, you come to uh, Q&A with A and V on... Um, Wednesday evenings. Okay, let's see what we have here, uh, which is incorrect. No host proteins are involved in the budding process. That's wrong, of course, because the escort proteins are host proteins. Everything else is correct. The envelope can be acquired after or simultaneous with assembly. The spike can drive budding. Absolutely. Lipids assist. Myristate, well, membrane can be acquired for all these places. Yeah, they're all right. But that one is not. Now, another example of um, budding from different components is exemplified by herpes virus. Boy, the herpes viruses seem to just break all the rules, don't they? 
Well, they don't break the rules. They just do things a little bit differently. So here we have the whole pathway of assembly and egress. So the capsids are made in the nucleus, right? We saw that today. The DNA is put in. Then they bud out of the nuclear membrane. They acquired the nuclear membrane, and now they're in the endoplasmic reticulum. And here are EMs of each of these steps. Here's a particle budding from the nuclear membrane, and here's one in the ER. Well, that's not a good place to be for a virus. What does it do next? This membrane that's, that it's acquired fuses with the ER and out comes the nucleocapsid into the cytosol, but now it's naked, right? So what is it going to do? Well, it buds into the trans-Golgi network <laughs> where the viral glycoproteins have been inserted. So now we have a bona fide virus particle there, and you can see photographs of those. How do they get out? Well, if they fuse, they would lose this membrane again, but they don't. They're released in a vesicle. So that's what mediates transport between the uh, Golgi and the plasma membrane, these vesicles that pull things from one place to the other. So herpes virus ends up in a vesicle. So a vesicle pinches off from the trans-Golgi. You can see photographs of herpes viruses in them. And then they fuse with the plasma membrane and release the viruses by exocytosis. That, of course, is a normal cellular process, and um, it, it releases cellular components. And in this case, in a virus-infected cell, it releases mature infectious herpes viruses. I wanted to point out an interesting series of events that happen with flaviviruses as they mature and go through the ER and Golgi. Uh, so the, the flaviviruses think West Nile virus, dengue virus, yellow fever virus, and others. Uh, the virus particle is formed in the endoplasmic reticulum. Okay, it has an envelope, and it's studded with glycoproteins that are flat on the surface. However, they're flat in the mature particle, but when they're made, they're actually sticking up. So here's the viral glycoprotein. Uh, it consists of a the E protein, which is the major one, the gray one, and the PRM, the precursor to M. And as these particles are made in the ER, they're, they're sticking up. But we can't have that. They need to be pushed down. They need to be spring-loaded. And so that happens as the this particle passes through the trans-Golgi where the pH drops from 7.2 in the ER to 6.7 to 6 and even 5.7. And as the pH drops, that pushes the E protein down flat on the surface. Because remember, the virus particle has these flat glycoproteins. And so as the virus particle is released, the glycoproteins are flat and spring-loaded for entry. The other thing that happens as the virus passes through the, um, the Golgi is there, there are proteases in the Golgi called furins, and there's a furin site between PRM and E. It's cleaved, and then when the virus is released, into the extracellular milieu. PR floats away, and we have the mature virus particle. And by the way, the red is the, it looks like someone's fingernail, doesn't it there? It's the fusion peptide, which is hidden. And at, when this virus now enters a new cell and the pH drops, these are going to pop back up again, and that fusion protein is going to insert into the membrane to mediate fusion. I mean, how beautiful is this? You push them down to spring-loading the spring load them on the way out, and then they pop back up again at low pH. Man. Another way, a curious way, that vaccinia viruses leave cells is they may be propulsed on actin tails. One cell pushes them into another. So here we have a vaccinia virus infected cell. The Virus particles have matured within the cell. They're transported to the cell surface on actin on um, microtubules. In the cell, they're actually double membraned, and they lose that outer membrane at the plasma membrane. So now we have a cell associated virus cell uh, here cell associated envelope virion as opposed to intracellular enveloped virion. They lose the outer membrane. And at the cell surface, these viruses actually bind a cell receptor called X, which initiates a transduction pathway to loosen up 
the act and repolymerize the actin filaments, and they push these viruses away from the cell on these long protrusions. So CEV binds a receptor. That receptor binding triggers a signaling pathway that forms these actin and the cell-associated virus, the cell-associated envelope virus gets pushed into the next cell. You know, cells are growing next to each other, so this can infect the next cell. It's a way to uh, just um, push these virus particles into the next cell. And these are the two pictures showing that on the right an electron micrograph where you can see these actin filaments pushing a virus particle away from a cell. And here is a staining of viruses in red. And uh, you can see they're on the tips of these protrusions, which are based on these actin filaments. So the virus induces the formation of these in order to get propelled to uh, the next cell. Now, um, envelope viruses, as we saw, can be released by either budding or within vesicles. That can happen in an epithelial sheet to look at some physiological relevance uh, in a respiratory tract, for example. They can bud from the surface, in which case that's how they would spread to another host. They could spread from cell to cell, and they could spread in both ways. We know mechanisms of spread. So when, when respiratory viruses spread laterally from, say, different parts of the respiratory tract, they can go from cell to cell depending on the virus. So envelope viruses are very easy to understand how they leave cells. What about icosahedral viruses? Well, non-envelope viruses uh, can kill the cell. They can cause cell, cause cell lysis. They can cause apoptosis. They can cause necroptosis, all different forms of uh, programmed cell death. Uh, these viruses also encode proteins that induce rupture of cell membranes. They can form pores in cell membranes that facilitate their release from the cell, and that's a feature of polyomaviruses, and that many viral proteins uh, inhibit protein synthesis, and this causes a loss of membrane integrity, which facilitates uh, the rupture of cells. So member, many uh, different ways to get out of a cell uh, in order to spread to a, a new host. So these are called lytic mechanisms of release. Now, there is also apparently non-lytic. There are also apparently non-lytic mechanisms of release of non-enveloped viruses. Although you would think it's counterintuitive, uh, here's an example of that for poliovirus. As you recall, poliovirus infection induces the synthesis of these double-membraned vesicles, and it's on their surfaces that uh, genome replication and, and assembly of particles occurs. Uh, but these, if they are formed late in infection, they can capture fully formed virus particles. And many of these vesicles will go to the plasma membrane and fuse and release virus particles. And uh, this is somewhat analogous to the exosomal pathway where cells uh, produce uh, various components within vesicles and release them as exosomes. And certainly some viruses can be released by exosomal pathways. In fact, hepatitis A virus, apocornavirus like polio, sometimes acquires a membrane in this fashion uh, and can therefore be shielded from the immune response. Very interesting. So in the case of polio, this is a small percentage of release, but the mechanism of the, is there and it should be uh, considered. So we now reach to the, half, the theoretical or conceptual halfway point in this course. And that is the end of this series of sessions where we're talking about events that happen in infected cells in the laboratory. So next time we're going to talk about what I call the infected cell. We're going to have an overlook at overview of all the events that happen in a cell that are relevant to virus reproduction changes in metabolism, protein synthesis, and so forth. So this really, this week will end the first half of this course. And then after that, we start to talk uh, about virus disease. And so let's go back to some questions here and uh, have a, a final discussion. Do you know of any credible scientists doing your kind of publication um, on this platform? I'm sure there are. I 
I'm sure there are here on YouTube, but the fact is that they're few and far between because research takes a lot of time. And so mo most scientists do not have the time to do that. There are certainly many people putting their lectures here, um, but um, I'm a little out of control. I do probably too much, but I like it. So, and that's why I'm, I made the incubator so I could do it more. And with your support, I can continue and make an enduring system where scientists can continue to communicate. Earlier, you mentioned high pressure. Is that calculated or really measured? Yes, it's measured. And there are people who study this for various viruses and they can measure the pressure. I don't know how they do it offhand. I don't know, but plenty of articles about that. Yes, Brienne has a channel where she puts her, her videos up from her class. Uh, so you can see right now she's teaching immunology. So you can check that out. But um, it, there are few, and uh, this was something I encouraged her to do a number of years ago, actually, which she do, did as a consequence of seeing what I did. And so uh, I think it's great to inspire other people. And there are others, I'm sure. You can find others as well. John, thank you so much for your support. Um, appreciate it. Um, as I said, I do a lot of science communication as a, as a research scientist. I, it would be I would be hard pressed to do this at the beginning of my career, even in the middle of it. But in the latter third of my career, I started doing this, and it's possible. And I wanted to continue the company forward and have other people working in it. And that's why the incubator is important, and that why that's why your support is important because I don't want to do ads. I don't want to monetize here on YouTube. I think it's distracting. I think we can support this company. The microbe tv by contribution so i could be wrong but we'll see we're going to work on it how's the virus maintaining the species specific ptm of proteins sorry what's ptm Thank you, Barb, for your support. And these are all recorded, of course. You can listen to them over and over if you had to leave in the middle. No problem. When did the pH gradient get discovered? So um, it was actually discovered in virus-infected cells. Uh, Ari Hellenius and others were studying, Kai Simons were studying virus uptake using Actually, they were using a virus as a model to study endocytosis. They discovered the pH drop that way. Um, I would say 80s. I could be wrong about that, but that's my impression. Uh, the midterm will go up this weekend. It will take some time for me to get it up there on YouTube. No, it's going to be Survey Monkey because I don't have a good alternative, but uh, it'll go up this weekend. Uh, yes, maybe some virology students here would like the chance to win a signed copy of Parasitic Diseases on TWIP. So tomorrow we record TWIP 200. We're going to do it at the incubator. Dixon and Daniel are going to join me there in person. And there we have books, Parasitic Diseases, Volume 7, which they will sign. And then uh, every, every month we have a, a clinical case that Daniel presents. You can send in your guesses. And whether they're right or wrong, you're entered in a giveaway every episode for a free copy. And Andrew was the latest winner of PD7. And now that I'm getting them there to sign them, I could start sending them out. Anyway, go over to TWIP and check that out if you'd like. You have to listen, of course. I uh, hope public support increases. Well... The limiting factor at the moment is that we're not a 501c3, right? A, a nonprofit, which means your contributions can be tax deductible. 
uh, I applied in April, I think, for Microbe TV. You have to apply to the IRS. And they have not gotten to March's applications yet because they're backlogged. So I'm very unhappy about that because at the end of the year, you know, people can give substantial donations because they would like the tax deduction. So I actually have a hired a fundraiser, Jeff, who goes to the Wednesday night live streams, um, who's convinced that we can substantially support Microbe TV. Um, but we're looking at alternatives for 2021 before we become a, a nonprofit. Oh, post-translational modification. Good, thank you. Now let me go back to that question and see if I can um, find it. Hey, where is it? Where is it? PTM. Damn. Oh, here we go. Uh, how is the virus maintaining the species-specific post-translational modification of proteins? Well, I don't, I'm not aware of any changes that viruses induce in those modifications like meristoilation and so forth. So I don't think there's any need to interfere with that. Uh, there was another. Where am I speaking in Nebraska in March? I don't know yet. I have to get on that, actually. So I'm, I'm visiting University of Nebraska. I, I will let you know. Right after this, I will look it up, and at the next class, I will tell you. Here we go. Can you please go over what happens with the furin cleavage sites when it cleaves in assembly or during entrance? What determines when it does one or the other? Um, let's see. Is there an opportunity to do this another time? Yes. We're going to talk about this when we talk about tropism. So I have more on that later. YouTube will put ads on your video if you like it or not. Well, I have monetization shut off on the videos. And um, my understanding, Ribosome Studio, great name, is that they will respect that. And I I wouldn't know because I pay YouTube monthly so I don't see ads anywhere because I hate them. <laughs> but does, that, does anyone see ads on, on my videos? Let me know. My friend has published an article and he referenced you... <laughs> That's cool. Thank you. By the way, Jillian Michaels' video of my interview with her went up, in case you're interested. Oh, he referenced TWIV. That's cool. Excellent. Even better. There are no commercials on this channel. I do not. Yes, they don't put it on. If I say no monetization, I don't see how they would do that. There's a box I tick for every video that I post. I have to tick a box every time because there's no default. And I'm leaving a thousand bucks on the table every month. But I hate ads for learning. Ads are bogus. I'm sorry. And so I'm hoping donations to a nonprofit will overcome it. Hey, I could be wrong, in which case I'll just keep doing this. <laughs> yeah, you could get them autographed. Someone is coming this week, actually, to, to get autographed. I don't know where, though. You'd have to ma um, mail them in right, to me, and that would kind of be expensive. When the uh, leaving the cell with actin tails, how does the CEV detach from the membrane to go to the next cell? That is a good question. I think that's just taken up um, by um, the entry pathway. I'm not sure if it's fusion. It could be fusion at the plasma membrane. Um, it could be endocytosis. I don't know the answer to that. It's a good question. Yeah, I wonder if there's a virus that induces its own. I'm sure there is, Tom. I'm sure there is. I'm just not aware of it. And it's not in the book, which is not saying that it doesn't exist for sure. Yeah, I don't think there are any ads. I pay for it as well because I find it so disruptive. Especially, I use YouTube to learn things, right? And in the middle of an explanation, they interrupt it with an ad. It's ridiculous. Now... Many people don't mind that because they're looking at entertainment 
and you know if you if you watched tv you always used to ads anyway so it's fine i have no no nothing wrong with ads in fact youtube exists because of ads but i think there should be a place for education and that's what i'm trying to do that's very nice of you thank you thank you very much oh and you have you're in my book thank you very much <laughs> And here's a link to my chat with Jillian Michaels, who really praises me embarrassingly to some extent in the beginning. It's amazing. You know, she's, well, that's cool. I mean, maybe that's a way to have her listeners follow her. Although um, she says right away, please, this is going to be about COVID. Please don't leave because I think a lot of people would leave otherwise. But I just try and uh, go on many shows as I can. SARS-CoV-2 infected cells generate filaments. I'm not aware of it being actin. I don't know. Remember, the um, the particles are released when a vesicle fuses with the plasma membrane. Your twiv on smallpox was fantastic. I understand it to my wife's aunt, who is a virologist who spent a career on and maintained. Oh, cool. Very good. Uh, yep, Rich, it was great because Rich Condit spent his life on, on working on a vaccinia virus for sure. Yes, Jillian asked great questions and let me answer. Uh, not everybody does that. Many people like to talk, right? So I was on this podcast, E is for Explicit. And the guy was very nice, but he liked to talk a lot in between me, which I don't do when I'm talking to someone. I let them talk. And sometimes on TWIV, other people talk too much during interviews. That's why if I do a one-on-one, -on -one, I let them talk because it's about them, right? You can put ads only in the end or in the beginning. No, you, you can put them anywhere. You can put them in the middle. I tell you, the, the interface, you can pick ads all over the place. Um, but I'm not doing it. I just, I promise not to do it. Thank you, Kate, for your contribution. Really appreciate it. You notice, I, I don't know if you noticed, the background is different today. Um, so I'm not at the incubator this week. I'm at home where all this... Started. In fact, uh, Vanity will tell you that the entire spring 2021 virology course at Columbia was taught pretty much from down here. <laughs> and uh, I have done less here because of the incubator, but here I am. Yes, uh, if you are in the military, you get the smallpox vaccine. That's correct. That's one of the few populations that still get uh, smallpox vaccine, which I got years ago as a kid. I still have my small, smallpox scar. Yeah. Oh, you like the Jillian Michaels? Yeah. Uh, fitness as Earth's. I think that's pretty funny. She's very fit, Jillian. Wow. Um, but she, I thought she asked good questions. It was good. Uh, you hate those kind of interviews who talk more than the interviewed. Yeah, I think they should be edited because it's not about you. It's about your guest, right? You think ads are a terrible idea. I, I agree. I'm not running ads anywhere, and I don't get ad support for the pods. I could. I could get quite a bit of money from ads, but I don't. First of all, I'm not going to have any pharmaceutical companies supporting me. No, it's a conflict of interest. And... I used to have like a curiosity stream. We had Drobo for a while. We had, oh, we were some of the first people to do a Blue Apron. And I was amazed at how many scientists picked it up. But uh, I don't want to do it anymore. I want to have listener supported science communication. So it's an experiment. We'll see if it works. We'll see. The E for guy has only around 600. He said he has another channel. All right. He has another channel where he has a million subscribers. I don't know if it's it's just audio or whatever, but that's what he told me. And I, I yeah, he runs ads. Is, I'm not, she's manscaping. I see those ads everywhere. I'm not going to run manscaping ads here. It's crazy. Smallpox vaccination is my first childhood memory. 
So it's very interesting that the scraping of the skin with the needle causes inflammation that makes the vaccine take better. We did a TWIV on that, a, a group did the study which showed that in rabbits. If you inject the vaccine, you get less of an immune response than with the bifurcated needle where you scarify. It's, and that causes inflammation, of course. You know, inflammation isn't all caused by infection. It can just be tissue damage. So it actually helps to make the response better, which blows me away. Yeah. All right, folks, looks like um, we're finished here for today. I'll see you back on Wednesday where we will talk yeah, variolation and, and using the bifurcated needles for smallpox. Um, see you on Wednesday. We're going to talk about the infected cell. And still then, uh, please be safe. Thanks for coming and thanks for your support. See you later. <laughs>